Okay, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome to a very chilly Tassie evening. Thank you for those uh, beautiful screens there, Jeff. I love that uh, big pineapple, mate. Warms the cockles. Beautiful. Welcome to our McAllen Editions Vertical Online Tasting, everyone. It's what's been dubbed the Mac back to back to back to back. How about that? Very happy to have you. I'm Todd from Destination Cellars. Um, we're here in Hobart, uh, the whiskey capital of this great sunburnt land of ours. On behalf of all of us here at Destination Cellars, um, and a big thank you to my great crew, um, Christopher, Jay and Adam, who will be doing the mixing duties, um, including some of the greatest hits you've ever heard. Um, Cymbeline and Adrian for their help as well and a very warm welcome to you. Hope you're all doing well out there, being forced out of your PJs, back into your work clothes, having to interact with your fellow humans again. Are you okay? We hope you're okay anyway. Tonight, we're going to be drinking colors. Look at those things. We're drinking colors tonight, people. Very excited. Some of my favorite drams have been coming out of McAllen for these editions. Very big thank you to McAllen Australia and to Spirits Platform for helping us get this event together. G'day to Gareth and Bridge back in Melbourne. And uh, a very big hello to you, Andy. How are you, mate? Welcome. Thank you, thank you. It's uh, everyone, thank you very much for having me in your land room or your bedroom or your bathroom, wherever you are tonight. Um, it's very nice to be uh, virtually with you to, uh, to go through and do this tasting. Fantastic, mate. And can you tell everyone out there, you're the, the brand ambassador for Spirits Platform and to, um, for McAllen Australia. Can you tell us what that entails? Uh, yeah, so I've, uh, I work for Spirits Platform as brand ambassador and I look after Victoria, Tasmania and Western Australia. Um, but at the moment, it tends to be more Victoria than anything, uh, unless I'm appearing virtually like I am tonight. Uh, I look after the whole portfolio of Spirits Platform and if anyone's uh, aware of our portfolio, we are very whiskey heavy, which suits my, uh, my palate very well. Uh, we've also got some Remy Martin cognac uh, and, and quite a, a few liqueurs as well and Mount Gay rum. So I look after the whole portfolio uh, and it's my job to go and train bartenders and uh, do whiskey dinners and, and then appear virtually um, wherever you are at home right now. Fantastic, mate. Thank you. And uh, country boy from Victoria, born and bred, out at Warrnambool. One of Warrnambool's favourite sons, I believe, uh, Dave uh -huh. Hughes and Jonathan Brown get a, a little bit of a mention from time to time. Um, a Geelong footy fan from way back. Yes, yes. Long suffering, more recently, not so much. Um, uh -huh. And when you were 19 years of age, you joined the army. Yes, that's correct. And I, uh, wanted to be a helicopter pilot. And um, what happened then? Uh, so I went in and, uh, and, and did my interview with them and uh, with a bit of a gleam in my, glint in my eye, I said I wanted to be a helicopter pilot, like probably 99% uh, of the other applicants going in there that day. And uh, they told me I was too tall and they probably told the other guy he was too short and the other people that are either too fat or too thin. And, and in the end they said, we've got the perfect position for you, which is infantry. <laughs> so not knowing too much about what infantry was, uh, my grandfather never told me he served in World War II. Um, I said, yep, that sounds fantastic. Let's do that. Um, they sold me on the um, ride a motorbike to work and then, uh, you know, fly helicopters or in the back of a helicopter home. And uh, it all sounded very adventurous to me. So uh, off I went and ended up in Townsville for four and a half years. All right. So... I think all of us who watched Airwolf as, as children really wanted to, to fly those super fast helicopters. Yep, exactly. I think that's probably what spurred me on. Um, that was a fantastic show. I don't think it's aged very well, though. And they let you down so easily, the bastards. <laughs> yep, that's right. I did really enjoy my, my time in the army and uh, got a lot out of it. Nothing that really transferred over to civilian life, uh, apart from the drinking, apparently. So uh, that served me very well. I hope you stayed away from that Forex gold. <laughs> um, there's not much else uh, up in Townsville around the, uh, the turn of uh, the 2000s. 
Fantastic, mate. And then you um, you decide to go back to uni to study some advertising, go back into the into the real world. Uh, yeah. So originally, when I did leave school, I went to Melbourne and and started to do electrical engineering, and found out in less than a semester it wasn't really for me. So that's why I did join the army. Uh, I didn't want to go back to farm life. So uh, I thought I'll I'll fulfil my childhood dream. And then when I got out, I uh, got into advertising at uni and absolutely loved it. I, I found it was really great to help, you know, with my creativeness that I had to, to be able to um, build on that. But I needed to, you know, survive living through uni. So I started working behind bars and uh, it turns out I love that even more. And, you know, apart from being brand ambassador for the last two years, I'd, I'd been doing that since. So 15, 16 years working behind bars and yeah, I loved it. And it's helped me to move on into this position now. I love the idea that there's a bartender out there who, when he calls last drinks, people just say yes. <laughs> you take on your, your four years of military training and like, yeah, I reckon this guy, we might, we might leave now. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it, it definitely helps when uh, I'm, I'm a big guy as well. Uh, so, you know, that definitely helps to, uh, to persuade some people to, to leave on time. Cool. And, and you started at the Crown Casino and then you worked your way into um, many cocktail bars and, and played your trade in lots of places. And then 2012, you won a competition to represent the nation going to France with Chartreuse. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. That's uh, my other uh, true love. I've got whiskey and I've got Chartreuse. Um, and I'm sure a few people are probably turning their noses up at it. It's, uh, it's definitely a spirit that's got probably more of a bad reputation than a, a good reputation. Sorry, not so much spirit, but a liqueur. Um, 55%. I remember the first time I was introduced to it. Uh, it was three o'clock at a nightclub when we were leaving. A mate bought it for me, and I will admit I had more trouble keeping it down than um, uh, than anything. And, and I, I swore that I'd never drink it again. And then I started working in the the lighthouse account for Chartreuse in in Melbourne, Katook Bar on Chapel Street in South Yarra, and, and found a love for it. And yeah, it's something that I've I've kept close to me ever since. Wonderful. And in 2018, you took on the, the role with Spirits Platform after them courting you many times, of course. And, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, uh, Bridget approached me on a few occasions. She's the state manager here in Victoria and looks after Tasmania as well. Um, originally, when Spirits Platform formed after Suntory got swallowed up by Coca-Cola, um, there was a few brands that didn't want to be part of, of, um, of Coca-Cola and uh, Ian Atherton, the old CEO of Suntory, uh, started Spirits Platform. Uh, to start off with, they were very liqueur heavy, um, some fantastic liqueurs. So Chartreuse is one of them. I've kind of gone full circle and now I'm brand ambassador for that. Uh, but over the years, they picked up some absolutely amazing whiskey brands within their portfolio. So uh, that was definitely something that, that helped my decision. Thank you, mate. Um, so Andy has, has kindly agreed to answer some questions for us tonight. If you have any questions for him throughout the course of the, the evening, either on the, the drinks or his fantastic beard. Um, please put them into the, to the chat area. Uh, Jason Adam will, will select them over the course of the evening and you can ask him directly if you wish. So hope you're all sitting comfortably up on the couch. You've got your rug boots on. You've got a, got a cleansing ale if you wish. There's no judgment. I've heard this uh, Captain Blyze isn't too shabby. How's that one, Adam, eh? Hey. <laughs> um, sit back and relax, and we, we might start them off, mate, with the, with the warm-up dram. Can you get some yes. of that into us? Fantastic. So we're going to start off with uh, Naked Grouse. So it's a nice, uh, nice easy whiskey. Uh, it's not uh, too complex. It's a nice warm-up one for us to start off with. So Naked Grouse sits within the... Edrington portfolio. Edrington is the owners of the Macallan. Uh, and this is a blended malt. So for the people that don't know what a blended malt is, essentially it's, it's like a blended whiskey. It just doesn't have any grain whiskey sitting behind it. So this is made up of single malts from different distilleries. It's a blend of those single malts. And the dressing malts that we use within it uh, come from Macallan, Glenrothes and Highland Park distilleries. They're all within uh, the Edrington group. Um, three amazing uh, brands that I get to, uh, to represent. So what we love about Naked Grouse is that it suits every part of whiskey drinking. So um, you can drink it neat like we are tonight. 
you can enjoy it in a, in a cocktail. Uh, it suits cocktails very well. Uh, it's great it's just as a mixer as well, whether you want to have it with dry ginger, have it with soda in a highball, um, with fresh apple juice, uh, or even ginger beer is like a mule style of a drink. Uh, in fact, I tend to use it in cocktails when I ask for any type of dark spirit, whether it be a rum or a tequila or anything like that, I chuck in a bit of naked grass and it's, it's absolutely fantastic. So the thing that sets it apart as a blended malt is what we do is we vat all the single malts together and then we put it into a first fill Oloroso cask for six months before bottling and that just aids to get all those single malts in uh, to mingle and get to know each other quite well. It's kind of like how lasagna always tastes better the day after you make it because like all those flavors have gotten in to, to get to know each other a little bit better. And that's why we've called it the naked grouse is because we put into these naked casks that have never held any, any uh, single malt whiskey before. So that's where the name comes from. Bit of a naked bottle looks pretty cool as well. Um, but the kicker is it's a, um, it's a, it's a 55, $60 whiskey. And um, I'll let you in on a little trick. Um, a little secret of mine is that I've got a decanter at home and it's a really nice decanter. It was quite an expensive present. Um, that my family got me years ago and I actually put naked grouse into that decanter so that when my friends come around um, I pour them a whiskey out of the the fancy decanter uh, little do they know that it's a it's a 55 60 dollar whiskey they think it's a, a three four hundred dollar whiskey um, and they don't know any different at all and you know it is still a nice you know a, a sipping whiskey it's not um, um, but it's not gonna you know knock your socks off in in any um, sense of the word uh, against the McAllen's tonight. You know, I'm not expecting it to win when we do our vote later with uh, with the best whiskey on the night, but for bang for buck, it's definitely my pick. Absolutely. Now, Edgington Group is known for their um, sherry casks that they import. In fact, um, the McAllen, which we'll be tasting later, actually spends more on casks than any other malt distillery. We do actually have quite a need for um, for second fill casks or refill casks, especially with um, the famous Grouse being one of our brands as well. It's the biggest, um, most drunk blended whiskey in Scotland. So they do need to use quite a few refill casks, especially when we're maturing our grain whiskey and don't want to have a lot of oak influence on it for making our blend. So that's the reason why I've gone to use a, a first fill cask um, for helping to aid with the vatting of the naked Grouse. Andy, mate, yes. do you um, do you ever recommend people drink this product neat as well? Yes, definitely. I'll do it as well. This is the the type of whiskey that if I've had a, a really shitty day at work, <laughs> um, and you know, believe it or not, I do have the occasional shitty day at work, even in my um, vocation, that I can come home and pour myself a nice big dram of it, responsibly, of course, um, and then sit down and watch some crappy TV show that my partners put on TV like um, Married at First Sight or what is it these days it's um, uh, that cooking show on Channel 10 and I can just sit down and just you know drink it and not have to worry about it too much but know that it's still going to be you know something that's that's pretty tasty as well. Don't drink Andy don't drink angry mate come on. <laughs> exactly and as I said you know it's the one that I pour for my friends when they come around to my house because they know I do have quite a lot of uh, expensive whiskey. Um, so if I pour them this out of a decanter, in their mind, this is the best whiskey that I've got in my house. Uh, and none of them will turn around and say that it's, it's horrible tasting. So, it's, it's an extraordinary achievement for, for that price. It really is. Mm, that's right. Um, and as I, you know, it, it works really well, as I said, as, an, as a highball. Um, which is just whiskey, soda, rocks, and a, a slice of lemon. Um, I find you get a lot of chocolatey notes coming out of it like that. And if I am going to drink it as a boiler maker, I pair it with a nice red ale. It tends to, to match those flavours that it has really nicely. I've just got a, a pale ale tonight, though. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, mate, with, um, with the Macallan series, can you tell us a little bit about how that came to be? The, uh, the edition series? Well, that's a, that's a really great question. And, and I, um, you know, I don't have the exact answer for it, but I'd like to talk about how I'd like to imagine the story went. Um, I could just imagine that 
uh, back in those days, it was Bob Delgano. He was our master whiskey maker. And I could just imagine him um, taking a tour of some of the executives um, through one of the warehouses. And um, as we know, uh, with the major whiskey distilleries, they love their secrets. They don't like to give out much information at all. Um, so what I do love about the additions is the fact is that we have given out as much information as we can about what goes into making these whiskies. Um, if we were to go any further, we'd put an age statement on it, but unfortunately we can't do that because there might be whiskey in there that's 10 years old. There might be whiskey that's 40 years old. And under Scotch Whiskey Association regulations, uh, if we were to put an age statement on there, we'd have to put the youngest one, which would be 10. And that's just not fair to the older whiskies that go into it. And I can tell you there are whiskies that are older than 18 years old in some of these. And I can tell you that there are whiskies that are over um, 30 in some of these. I just can't tell you which ones. Unfortunately, that is that one secret that we uh, have to hold on to when we're talking about the additions. Um, so I like to think about Bob taking a bit of a tour of the executives of, of McAllen or Edgington Group through a warehouse and just saying, I've, I've got this idea and uh, you might not like it at all, but how, what if we do give out all the secrets to what goes into making these whiskies? You know, something that the other major whiskey houses have never done before. Um, and just to probably see a bit of a, a shocked look on their faces. Um, and that's what essentially the editions are about. And it's also telling a story about how McAllen's made, uh, our mastery of wood as well. Um, we've got a gentleman by the name of Stuart McPherson and his actual title on his business card says Master of Wood. Uh, now that's something that I aspire to having on my business cards as well. Um, so I might have to work my way up through through the McAllen as brand ambassador to, to get to there. But um, his sole purpose is just to go and source casks from either Spain or from America um, sourcing the wood. Uh, so that's, you know, it's, as I said, we spend more on cast than any other malt distillery in Scotland. So we want to showcase what the wood gives to our, to our whiskies. And the addition is kind of, it tells a bit of a story as we go through them um, of the style of cast we use, but it, it has the, the DNA, the Macallan, all these additions do, but no two, no two of them are exactly the same. And they're not like drinking a, a standard Macallan release. Um, so they're kind of like cousins to the family of McAllen. So they've still got the same DNA, but they're just not, you know, they're not the same like brothers and sisters. Um, and as we go through, each one starts to tell a bit more of a story. So uh, the edition one, I think was just a bit of a, a small release to see if it would work. That one was done by Bob himself. Uh, we did a release in Spain. Um, obviously Spain's very important to us because that's where we source most of our casts from, um, from holding sherry in them before. Uh, we did a little restaurant called El Cellar Dick and Rocker. Um, and if anyone's watched Chef's Table, this is the only restaurant in the world to uh, have one best restaurant in the world uh, more than once. It's won it twice. It won it in, uh, I think, 20, 2015 and 2017, I think. So 2016, we actually got the brothers, uh, Jordi, Joan and uh, Joseph over to the McAllen Distillery and we used them to help create the edition number two. Uh, that was the year they didn't win best restaurant in the world. So maybe it was because they were drinking a bit too much Macallan over in Scotland and enjoying themselves. Uh, so anyway, these brothers are actually do each little, each part of uh, running a restaurant. So one's the sommelier uh, on the floor, another one's the head chef. And then we've got Jordy, who's the youngest and he's the pastry chef. Um, they actually use their, all their senses. So their nose, their taste to, pick out the cast that they thought would make a great whiskey and then Bob helped to tie them all together. So that was the addition number two. Uh, when we talk about casts, they don't just give flavour and colour to a whiskey, they also give aroma. So that's where we, uh, we have the number three. So I'm not sure if everyone's finished their naked grouse yet, whether we've got to ready to go on to the addition three. Can we see go some on. thumbs up? Are ready? Or I don't want to rush people through this. So I'm actually talking a bit as well. So I'm just going to make so a bit of room in my glass there. Drink some yellow. So let's go on to the Macallan edition number three, and I'll tell you the story about that one. I love the sound of a cork coming out of a bottle. Actually, my dog actually loves that noise as well. Because he knows that I'm starting to drink something nice, and, uh, and I'm probably going to um, cheer up a little bit. But I'm not allowed to say that. I'm not allowed to say that um, drinking alcohol will improve your mood at all. So just want to be uh, 
want everyone to be aware of that. So, and your dog's of, mood. And my dog's mood. It improves my dog's mood. Let, let's say that. Um, so the edition number three, this one was a, another collaboration that we did. Um, this one was done with uh, Roger Dove. Um, now I'm looking at a lot of the guys out there. I'm sure you've heard of Roger Dove before. He's, uh, he's a perfumer uh, and he's probably the best nose in the business. So uh, when we're making whiskey at the McCallum, when we've got our, our uh, master whiskey makers, uh, it was um, Bob again that made this one. Um, so when he goes and tests all of our barrels, we've got about 330,000 barrels maturing at any one time, all on the McAllen estate. Um, he won't go through and he won't drink them going um, to test how good the casts are. Uh, the problem with that is uh, trying to taste 330,000 casts within a year. Um, I haven't done the sums, but that's um, it's about 800 casts a day. Um, you'd end up with quite a, a big hangover that would, would last quite a while. So he goes through and he'll draw some of the, the whiskey out of the cask and he'll look at the color because the color will tell him um, how fast that, how active the cask is and how quickly it is uh, influencing the maturing of that spirit that's in there. And it also knows it as well because the nose will actually tell you more of what's happening within that cask. Uh, number one, to tell you if the cask has started to, to sour or, or turn the whiskey bad. Uh, if that does happen, we will redistill what's in that cask and we'll sell it on to the, um, to the perfume industry. So they'll we'll use that as their base uh, for, for making uh, uh, perfumes, essentially like Christian Dior, that, that kind of company. Um, and then it will also tell them the, the aromas that are coming through and it will help him with that. So he doesn't actually taste most of it. And if he does, um, he'll actually drop it down to about 20% ABV which allow for a lot of those lighter notes to come through. So we've called Roger and asked if he wanted to do a collaboration. He's quite a big whiskey drinker himself and obviously jumped at the chance. And it was a really funny story that when he arrived at McAllen Distillery, obviously coming up from, um, from the south of, of, uh, of England, he uh, came up in a, in a helicopter and it landed and he got off and he was wearing this big, bright purple um, flowery um, number with a, a big um, hood on it that, that had um, like purple um, uh, bird's feathers and all that kind of stuff. So one, one of those big sort of things. And, and he got off and uh, the people at the distillery really weren't sure if this was going to work out or not. Uh, because Bob Delgano is a typical Highlander uh, sort of person. Uh, he's one of those guys that that plays those sports where they throw those logs around and, and toss hammers and, and things like that. And, you know, when you shake his hand, his hand's that big, it wraps right around yours. And um, they just thought that, that it wouldn't work out at all. Very flamboyant um, kind of person. Um, he is straight as well. Um, uh, but, you know, obviously being coming from the, the fashion industry, uh, he was very much wrapped up into that. And they thought that they were going to really clash a lot when they uh, came together. But, uh, surprisingly to everyone's amazement, uh, they got on like a house on fire, obviously, because they both work with their noses uh, all day with, uh, with the industries that they do. Uh, that they almost had this own language that they talked about when they were going through. And what Roger wanted to achieve with this whiskey, um, I'm sure some people have started to, to drink it already, but he wanted this to be uh, like a memory uh, the memory of when you're young and you're at the beach on a hot day and your parents buy you a, a vanilla ice cream and just when it starts to melt and starts to run down over the cone and over your fingers, that aroma that you get of that, you know, really rich, creamy vanilla, that's what he wanted to achieve when, when creating this whiskey, the edition number three. So excuse me, I'm just going to have a nose and a taste. Now, I'm sure everyone's noticed this is a little bit of a step up from the naked grouse, not just in flavour and aroma, but also in the ABV as well. Naked grouse is 40% uh, ABV, which is the minimum by Scotch Whiskey Association laws. The Macallan additions are all within the 48 ABV percent. So the edition number one was 48%. The edition number two was 48.2%. 
the addition number three is 48.3%. And I'm, I, I'm guessing everyone can see a bit of a pattern there and as it goes on. So up to the addition number five, which we'll be tasting last, uh, that is 48.5%. Now, something that, that makes my job really easy, especially with the additions, is we have all the information on the box. As I said, we're looking at transparency as much as we can, uh, still fitting within the Scotch Whiskey Association laws. Uh, so to look at this, there's a, there's a code on every box. So this one says C6V523T23-2017-003. So to let everyone know what, those, what that code means is um, C6 is um, six different types of casks have gone into making it. V523 is 523 casks in total were vatted. T23 is the tint. Um, so it's a, it's a tint number that we get. 2017 is uh, pretty self-explanatory and 003 being edition number three. Uh, then as we go down on the front of the box, we'll actually got a bit more information about all the types of casts that go into it. So um, to show it wasn't lying, there are six different types of casts here. So just reading off the box, uh, because it is hard for me to remember all of this information, especially going back to 2017 when this one was released. Uh, we've got a first fill butt of American oak, which comes from Hudosa or Hadosa. Uh, we've got uh, refill butts, so second fill, which is a mix of European and American oak. We've got a first fill to Vasa butt and puncheon, so they're the two different shapes of the 500 litre casks. Um, the butt is a short fat one and the puncheon is a long skinny one. So each one of those, even though they're the same, uh, size in literage will give different flavors and aromas to it. So the cask ends will give different flavors and aromas than what the staves will. So different lengths and, and different uh, sizes of those. Uh, and they're all European oak. We've got first fill bourbon hogsheads from America. Hogshead is a 250 letter cask, um, which has been made by getting five 200 letter casks and recuperating into um, one 250 letter. Sorry. Oh, my mass was way off with that. We get five 200 litre bourbon barrels and recoup it into four um, uh, hogsheads. We've also got a hogshead from European oak, um, which has come from Tavasa Cooperage. Uh, and then we've got first fill bourbon barrels, which have obviously come from America. And that's where all that rich vanilla comes from. Uh, we do invest very heavily in our, in our barrels, as I've said a couple of times already. Um, so to explain to you the different flavours that you're going to get from barrels, it comes from the different styles of wood. Uh, Macallan uh, doesn't add any artificial colouring to our whisky, so that all that colour is 100% natural coming from the casks. So if we're looking at American oak that's ex-bourbon, uh, especially with a heavy char, uh, American oak is very fast growing. It only takes 70 years to reach maturity until we can chop it down and turn it into a cask. Uh, that one has a lot of vanillins, which is a simple um, six string uh, chain of sugars, which when you heavily char the barrel, it caramelizes those sugars. So you get a lot of vanilla. Uh, you'll be getting things like creme brulee. There's a bit of coconut coming through from American oak and also some uh, lemon citrus. If it's American oak, which has had sherry in it before, it doesn't have that heavy char. It just has a bit of a toasting on the inside. So we dial down that vanilla a little bit. Um, so it still has that vanilla there and instead of having some coconut and lemon citrus, you might be getting some, some honey and some nuts coming through. For our European oak, European oak is full of baking spices, uh, dried fruits and, and also some orange citrus with that one as well. Now I don't want to bore you too much with all the rest of the information, but as you can see, it also gives you a, a percentage of the, of the cask use. I'm not sure if you can actually see that. There is quite a lot of information on the back of on the back of this. Um, the benefit is we do have some bottles for sale um, throughout the night. Um, Todd will be able to explain that a little bit more, but um, you will get one of these boxes there and you will be able to go through that uh, a little bit more with this one. Now, I would like to do a little bit of an experiment with some people. Now, I normally do it before tasting the edition three, but um, I can see there's a few people that are a bit keen that have already gotten into that. And um, I'm going to get everyone to close their eyes and um, don't worry, you're at home. No one's going to judge you too much. Um, so I'm going to get everyone to close their eyes now and I'm going to describe some things. I'm going to see if you can actually smell these things that I talk about. So uh, I'll get everyone to close their eyes now and I want you to imagine you're holding onto a big, ripe orange. 
Now with that orange, you get your thumb and you just poke it in through the zest and you get that little spray of orange oils just up over your face. Can anyone smell that right now? See a few people nodding. It's amazing that the power of smell and smell can actually help you to remember some things, but um, it's only really if you've smelt them before. And um, The next thing I'm going to um, get you to do is again, close your eyes. And now I want you to imagine you've got a, um, a beautiful, another fresh um, vanilla pod and you've just cut it right down the middle and you get your thumb again uh, because it tends to be a, the, the best tool we've got when we're cooking apart from knives. Um, and and you, you scrape it down the, the main side of the, the vanilla pod and you get that beautiful, rich uh, vanilla flavour that just comes out. Can anyone smell that now? Fantastic. So that's, that's, that's the power of smell. Um, so that's what we're going for with the edition number three here. And that's what Bob was looking for. And it's actually interesting that vanilla is one of the first aromas that we get. Um, I don't want to put anyone off drinking their whiskey, but uh, breast milk actually contains vanilla aromas in it. So that's why we tend to gravitate towards vanilla flavors, whether it be vanilla ice cream or, or, or the like, uh, is because it's one of the first aromas that we get. And, um, you know, if I was to describe something the aroma of something, if you've never spelt it before, you'll never, you know, be able to uh, appreciate it. Uh, and it goes when we're, you know, working on our palates, whether it be this uh, aroma with our olfactory senses in our nose or uh, the tasting with our palate in our mouths. If you've never tasted or smelt something before, you're never going to be able to pull that flavor out when you're tasting something. And it, it definitely is a lot of uh, a practice to be able to do that. And I'm still working on it as well. Um, but it translates over to, to a lot of things. Um, sometimes um, I've never actually admitted this to anyone before, so um, please keep this to yourselves, that um, when I use methylated spirits, I can get caramel aromas coming out of it. Um, believe it or not, it's just this flavour that I tend to get. There might be some vanillas mixed in there as well. That's just from methylated spirits. Um, I don't sit there smell, like sniffing methylated spirits, but I do use it sometimes when I'm, when I'm cleaning at home. Um, I really hope no one's thinking about methylated spirits now while they're nosing their Macallan. Um, I hope I haven't put anyone off with that one at all. Um, but it's one of those things that, you know, the more you work on it, um, the, the more you get it. And a lot of times you will be sitting there and you'll be nosing something or tasting something. And um, pardon the pun, you'll, you'll, you'll have that taste on the, on the tip of your tongue and you just won't be able to pick it. Um, but it's all about connecting those memories from what you've uh, eaten and smelt. And a lot of those come from when you're quite young. So um, I think, uh, Roger has absolutely nailed this one with that uh, vanilla um, ice cream that's melting at the beach when you're quite young. And um, this is a, a really great whiskey. It does actually evolve, especially with the aroma as it goes on once it's sitting in your glass. So if you have poured yourself a big dram of it, um, maybe sit it aside if you do have enough glasses and, and come back to it uh, later in the tasting. And remember, guys, if you've got any questions for Andy, just pop it into the chat and we can let you have a, have a chat to him yourself. Now, mate, tell us about... Um, can you, um, explain the tint that you mentioned earlier? Uh, yes. Yep, great question. So um, the tint is... is uh, it's, a, it's a number and it, um, I don't want to... Just about to say something, I wasn't too sure about it, so I think I'll hold back on that. But it, it's a there's every every sort of thing that is opaque that has light that can go through it. I think opaque is the right word. Um, um, can have a, a tint associated with it, and it's the amount of light that actually um, stops from moving through it. I think is how the the tint code works. Um, so I think the higher the tint number, the less light it allows through it. So um, that's what they've gone with that. So not so much with being a, a color or a shade of of, um, of that beautiful brown that we have with our whiskies. Um, I think it's more about the amount of light that it lets through with that one. So um, I aren't able to jump on Google at the moment, but if someone can get a better explanation, I would absolutely love it. So I've never had that question before, but, but thank you for that. Maybe Todd might be able to look into that one for me. That's right. Don't stop my head. back in a sec. <laughs> Mate, um, David's asked about the age. I think you were mentioning that there are anything um, from 10, 15, up to 30 years of age. Is that right? Yeah, um, it's a, a really great question. 
So uh, it is a non-age statement. Um, the problem with non-age statements is that uh, a lot of distilleries were starting to do it when uh, people got into drinking whiskey a lot more. And these days there are a lot more, more people drinking whiskey. Um, there's a lot more younger people that are coming into drinking it. I remember when I first started, it was still looked at being uh, an old man's sport, if you want to call it that, drinking whiskey, you know, um, sitting in a, you know, in a whiskey bar and in front of a fire and stroking a cat and, and all that kind of stuff. And um, whiskey is now starting to become a, a lot more fun. So there's more younger people that are drinking it, um, more demographics starting to drink it as well. Uh, a lot more females starting to turn up at, at whiskey tastings, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Uh, hopefully, eventually we'll get to that 50-50 mark or, or even more females coming along. Um, I think, it, but at the same time, that's a bit of a problem because I think my partner, she drinks a bit more whiskey than what I do. And I think she dips into some of the expensive ones I have sitting at home as well. She knows to stay away from that decanter with the naked grouse in it. Um, but anyway, getting back to the question, um, it is a non-age statement. And the reason for that is if we were to put full transparency out there and, and list all the ages of the whiskey that went into it, uh, the SWA would say that we're trying to be deceptive by, you know, if there's a if there's a 15 year old whiskey in there and a 30 year old, if we were to put both ages in, uh, SWA would say we're trying to be deceptive by putting 30 on there. We've only got a, only able to put 15. So um, for that, we've kept it as a non-age statement. But to give you a bit of an idea of, about the whiskies um, or our especially our cask management at McAllen is. Um, we'll tend to put whiskies that are over 18 years old or the ones we're leaving to mature longer than 18 into refill casks, whether we put it directly into that second fill cask or whether we re-rack into one to allow for a longer, slower maturation rate. So when I talk about this one, we've got, um, we've got a second fill, we've got refill butts that we've used in this one. So I would say that there are whiskies in here that are over 18 years old, just because of that fact. So again, um, McAllen does have a lot of uh, secrets that even the brand ambassadors aren't, um, uh, allowed to know that's up to the master whiskey making team who uh, was Bob back in those days and then moved through to Nick and Sarah. Thanks mate and then um, we encourage people to probably to nose all three of these it is a, a vertical tasting so if you do want to to nose and, and leave a little bit behind but I'm infatuated by green as, yes. as Australian kids growing up, of course, there was the the extraordinary green cordial that we were allowed to have if we were good, um, which we'd run around like cut snakes until we needed more sugar hit. Let's have a, have a look at the, the number four. Fantastic. Let's move on. So we're moving on to the Macallan edition number four now. Uh, so apart from being the fourth in our series, uh, this was the first edition to be done by Nick, who was our... Uh, very short running master whiskey maker. He took over from Bob um, and then he's moved on. He's with Bladnock now as the master whiskey maker there. So it's actually interesting that we've started with, with yellow and green or, or green and gold, if you want to call it that. So it is a very an Australian start to the tasting. So this one uh, was released in 2018. So um, I'm not going to bore everyone um, with all those codes again, but this has come from seven different styles of cask um, and there's 513 casks that have gone into this. So, um, when I do say 513, they're not all completely full. Um, we don't tend to re-rack casts too much. So, you know, if we are to release a 72-year-old, um, we might end up re-racking that because at 30 years old, a cask is half empty. So we don't want to have too many half empty casts because it allows for a more rapid evaporation of the spirit that's in there. Um, but, you know, if something's under, you know, 25 years old, we're going to keep it in there. We don't want to be moving too many casts around. So 513 casts that have gone into this, the, the vatting. Uh, this one coincided with the opening of a, uh, our new distillery and visitor centre we have on the McAllen estate. Um, I'm not sure if everyone's uh, seen a, a picture of it or a video. Um, if you do get a chance, jump onto the McAllen YouTube channel um, and have a look at the a video that we've got. Or there's a few videos on there about um, the new distillery, um, we did this amazing light show when we opened the new distillery. Uh, and if anyone has done a tour of distilleries in Scotland, um, I don't want to take anything away from it. I don't want to be rude at all. But, you know, once you've done one, you've kind of done them all. Um, 
they are absolutely beautiful places. Uh, these distilleries over in Scotland, they all do have their own little, you know, their sense of place and um, they've all got their little story to tell. But um, essentially, you know, um, they've all got their pagoda roofs if, you know, they still do floor maltings or if they used to and they, you know, they want to stay romantic. Um, you know, you, you enter and you normally enter and leave through the gift shop, which is fine. Um, I'll always buy a, a bottle or two um, after I've been through one. Um, but then you, you enter and you'll go through and you, you might see the, um, you might go through the mill room and then you, you know, you go through and you walk through the, the wash backs and the, um, the mash tons and then you go in and you, you check out the, the still room and, and then after that there's, there's not much after and, you know, some of them might have a, a few casts laying around that you'll do a bit of a tasting from, uh, if you're lucky enough or you, you know, you, you pay enough to, to do that sort of a tour and get to taste some straight out of the cask. And um, I'm, as I said, I don't want to take anything away from them at all. And I absolutely love doing it. I will go and eventually go to every distillery in Scotland because I want to do all their tours and and, uh, and and check out, you know, where that whiskey comes from and, and why that whiskey tastes that way. Um, but, you know, once you've done one, you've kind of done them all. Um, McCallum wanted to do something a little bit different. And the reason for that is the... The tourism trade for whiskey in Scotland, I think at the last the last figures I saw um, as of a couple of years ago, I'm not at all changed at the moment, um, was worth about 550 million pounds. So it's its its own industry, just the tourism of uh, heading to whiskey distilleries in Scotland. Um, so we wanted to, to, to buck that trend a little bit and create something uh, that's a, a lot different to, to what you'd be used to if you've uh, been to some distilleries in Scotland. Um, and we've created more of a, a visitor experience uh, and it goes through and it helps to explain the six pillars of the Macallan, um, which I'll talk about um, just before we taste the edition number five because that fits really neatly into the, into the, um, the six pillars. Um, but yeah, to, so to describe it, it's, it's not, you know, a box shape. It doesn't have white painted walls to, to make it look, you know, nice. And um, it, it's the best way to describe it would be um i'm really not allowed to say this so um that's why i think it's, i'm glad it's not really being uh live streamed to facebook at the moment uh is that uh the the rolling hills of the teletubbies tv show if anyone remembers that at all or has kids that really love it right now um, i'm not allowed to mention teletubbies at all so i've uh, i've just gone and done it twice um it was designed to to mimic the rolling hill uh Craigalaki hills um which it sits uh, at the foot of uh, so it's this kind of rolling shape like this. In fact, I've got a really good way of describing it because I've got the box here and hopefully you can see that on the side there. And that's actually um, what the distillery roof looks like. And if you could imagine that with a whole heap of grass on top and 36 amazing new distills, new stills made by uh, Forsyth's and Roth is sitting underneath it. Um, it's absolutely phenomenal. We want it to mimic the rolling hills of, of Kragalaki, but not, you know, be too much like an evil person's lair. If, if you get what I mean. Um, and if you are touring Scotland and you are going to a couple of distilleries and um, your significant other really hates whiskey or doesn't enjoy whiskey and, and probably hates being dragged to distilleries more than that, um, take them along and, and they'll absolutely get something out of it because it helps to describe the whiskey making process better than any other distillery that I've been to before. That's absolutely fantastic. So um, that's what the edition number four was released to, uh, to, kind of um, celebrate. So the way Nick's gone about making this whiskey is um, he's actually designed this whiskey the way you design a, a fancy new distillery or even a house. So he's chosen his casks um, to showcase the, the different parts of, of making a whiskey from, from scratch. So he started off and he's chosen a few types of casks that'll build the foundation of which you can build the rest of the whiskey on. So um, when you are creating whiskey, you don't just want to put all of the best casks in because it's not really going to work. And there's probably a lot of really strong flavors that are going to fight with each other to, to, to come to the forefront. Um, so it's like getting a, a whole heap of really, really um, um, outgoing um, people together. Um, so extroverted people, you get a whole heap of extroverted people in a room, there's going to be some fights and arguments. So you can't do the same thing with making a whiskey. So you need to have some of the introverts and they'll form the, the layer, um, uh, the base layer, the foundation of the whiskey. Then from there, you've got to choose some whiskey casts that will um, create the form and also the structure of the whiskey as well. And then uh, choosing a, a small amount of what that 
that top note of whiskies or, or what he calls the keystone. Uh, so if, if you've been over to the UK, you know the keystones, that last, um, that last stone they put in right at the top where they normally put the established date on or, or, or uh, something like that. It just kind of helps to hold everything together. So that's what he's gone through with this. So just quickly running through the numbers, um, we've got some refill butts, some refill hogsheads. Um, they're both European and American oak. Um, we've got a first fill hogshead, which is American. Um, now, when I do say American, I do mean American X Sherry. I'm just shortening a little bit. If I do say bourbon, I'll, that, that's what it'll be. Got some first fill butts, uh, European oak. Um, we've also got some butts and punchins and hogsheads, uh, European oak as well. So um, Nick's done that to, to celebrate the new distillery opening that we've gone through. So if I just can give a, a little bit more information on the back here. Um, the percentage of casts that we use within this, so 42% um, are butts, 40% are hogsheads, and punchins are 18%. Again, it's all the information that, that comes on the box there. So that's all the information I get with these as well. Um, and I think it's absolutely fantastic that the you know, consumers like yourselves can, can share in, in getting a lot of this information that we have with these. Excuse me, I'm just going to have a little taste. Now, oh, excuse me, it's been a while since I've had the edition for it. It's absolutely delicious. Uh, I find this one really strange because it is kind of backwards to drinking a, a normal Macallan or one from the core range. A uh, normal Macallan will, will start quite sweet and then it'll sort of um, uh, dry off as it goes through. This one starts very dry at the front of the palate. And as it washes back over the palate, it, it sweetens up quite a bit. And you get this almost, you know, candy kind of note right at the back there. It's uh uh, it's absolutely fantastic whiskey, this one. It's a rip and drink, mate. I quite like that one. Mm. Now, mate, we've got a, a question from, from Glenn, who's... Uh, Code name there is a little unpronounceable, mate. Uh, regarding the uh, the crystal, Mr. Duncan, if you would uh, if you would be so kind. Yeah, hi Andy, how are you? Uh, good, mate. Yourself? Yeah, good, good. Um, look, one of the things I've always really liked about the Macallan, and um, I know it doesn't actually apply to these particular whiskies that we're tasting here, but the Lalique Crystal that you use in the um, in a lot of the, the high-end Macallans. They're just stunning looking bottles. Uh, what's the story and connection there? Uh, so uh, we, we look at Macallan as being the, the peerless spirit when it comes to um, single malt whiskey. Um, we, we look at our direct competitors as being, uh, you know, Rolex, uh, Aston Martin, Louis Thirteen Cognac for, for taking our share of, of what our, you know, our tends to be our, our drinking market. So, you know, if, if someone goes to buy a Rolex, they're, they're probably, you know, it's going to take a bit of a share for us. So we also look at Lalique as, as being in a similar, um, similar, similar company to us. So um, we've actually been working with them for, for quite a while. Um, which have created some absolutely amazing decanters for us, whether it's the, the Reflection or the Number 6 or the M Decanter, which are part of our core range. Uh, the M Decanter Black is an absolutely sexy um, decanter that we use. And then also um, to one of the newest releases we've done, which was the 72-year-old last year. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone uh, saw that one, but that one's an absolutely um, beautiful um, piece of uh, crystal that they made for us there. So it's just a, a partnership that we've had all, all along. Um, want to ensure that, um, you know, we're putting the, the best spirit into the, the best decanters for sale. Yeah, I was lucky to, uh, to go to the Prime Cellars in Melbourne and I, I had a look at the, uh, the 72 year old. Absolutely stunning. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely amazing. I, uh, I actually went there to, to set that one up. So it feels amazing in your hand. Um, very nervous, very nervous, you know, obviously try not to shake too much. I didn't want to drop it. We only got one of them into the country and um, it's not like we could call up and say, oh, 
Andy stuffed up again. Can we get another decanter over here? Um, but yeah, it's um, absolutely phenomenal. Just the, even the, um, the the case that it came in as well, that mahogany wooden case. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. I think that one was actually my uh, my tasting bottle, Andy. So when you, when you do get your hand on that again, we'll have to crack that one, I reckon. Well, we might be able to get it. How many people have we got on the on the uh, conversation tonight? I reckon there's about 30, there's a few double ups. We've had a few people had to leave and a few that haven't been able to join tonight. So there's, there's about 45 that were signed up tonight. We've got about, so what are you saying? That everybody who's here tonight gets to try that uh, particular bottle that you're after? Well, I was just going to say, we did, um, we did sell it for $150,000. Um, if we all chipped in a little bit, if there's 30 people here, then what's that, uh, $5,000 each? We could all, you know, get about a nip of it. Yeah. And then at the end of it, we should smash the crystal decanter and we all get a little piece to take home. Creative destructionism, I love it. <laughs> it would definitely make for a, uh, for, um, a lot of conversation after the tasting. But uh, we do actually have it at the distillery. If you do get the chance to go to Scotland, please um, head up to... Um, to, to uh, Speyside and go to the distillery. You can actually purchase a, a dram of it for, I think, what are we doing for? Um, about 5,000 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, that was, that was going to be a segue to, to the next question. Um, what, is, what is the number one, the, the best Macallan you've ever had? And two, what is the most expensive one you've ever had? Ooh. All right, so the most expensive one I have had is the Macallan Black. Uh, this one's really interesting because we've got a little bit of peated malt that goes into it. And uh, Macallan is very famous for not using peated malt. But uh, during World War II, that was all we could get for making whiskey. We wanted to continue to, to make whiskey. So um, there is whiskey that goes into the, uh, the M Black decanter uh, that was distilled uh, in the uh, middle of the 1940s. Uh, to give you a bit of an idea about the age of the whiskey that goes into it. Um, so that's probably, that would be the most expensive I've had. Um, the best I've had, that's a, it's a really tough question. Um, I've had all of the editions so far. Uh, out of the editions, I'd say my favourite would be the edition number two. Um, the edition number one's very fast becoming uh, the most expensive whiskey I've ever had. Um, every time I look at it, it goes up in price. Uh, in fact, all these ones do as well. The edition three and the edition four are uh, starting to fetch quite a, a, a lot of money online in, in auction houses and in the secondary market. But um, look, the, the, the best one I've had, um, obviously everything tastes better um, with the environment you're in. So um, the ones I've had at the distillery were um, probably the best I've had. Uh, it's a bit of a funny story because uh, I was last over there uh, last year in, in April. Well, it actually turned out to be May when I was over there. And uh, I'd organised to do a tour of Glenrothes and the Macallan uh, on Anzac Day last year. Now, I left Melbourne at, supposed to be at 11 o'clock at night and my flight got delayed three hours. I missed my connecting flights in Dubai to take me over to uh, to. Manchester then up to Inverness and I was just going to drive down. Um, they were going to put me up at McAllen Estate uh, again um, <clears throat> and do that. But obviously I missed out and Glenrothes doesn't do tours at all. So you have to, you know, kind of get all your ducks in the road to be able to get there. So they couldn't uh, organise me another tour. And uh, I was there just before the Spirit of Speyside Festival as well. So it was all hands on deck and they couldn't uh, do anything to kind of uh, change my booking at the time. So I, uh, I just jumped online and, and booked myself a, a tour of the new distillery, which I hadn't checked out yet. Uh, just a, a regular tour and it's 15 pounds or something like that. But you get to do a bit of a tasting afterwards. And uh, I got there early to make sure I didn't miss out on it. I'd, I'd extended my stay uh, a little bit. I did a tour. I went to Oban and, and over to Isla as well. Uh, so I extended my stay a week. Oh, sorry, a day, pushed everything back. And I thought, I'll go to the, do the tour. I'll do it in the morning. Um, oh, sorry, early afternoon, and it will give me enough time to to drive back after the tour to to go to uh, Glasgow Airport and fly home. So I went up there and got there a bit early just to make sure that uh, there was nothing to stop me from doing this tour uh, to check out the new distillery, which I was excited to go and check out. Um, so I was just chatting to the to the ladies at the 
uh, reception and, and said, uh, told them my story and they're like, oh, oh, okay. Um, all right, well, uh, we'll see you for your tour. And, and I came back and uh, the, the girl behind the, the reception whispered something to, the, uh, to James who was taking my tour. And uh, one thing that absolutely surprised me with, with this tour was that how knowledgeable everyone was with doing the tours. And I really put him under his paces, but uh, he did know that I was a brand ambassador from Australia that was coming out to do the tour. And uh, the very lucky people that were on the tour with me after we went and did the tasting at the end of it, um, we tasted the edition number four. The edition number five wasn't out at that time. Um, he wouldn't give me any information about that either, but we also tasted a 25 and a 30-year-old. Um, so I'd say for the people that were on the tour with me, they're the best whiskies they've ever tasted and uh, probably the most expensive as well. But but just being there and, and, and being in Speyside at, at the McAllen Estate and, uh, and and tasting some whiskies there after doing a, an amazing tour was, was probably the, the best ones I've had. But uh, I think it was Jim McEwen that said that... Um, uh, the, what makes a whiskey taste better is, uh, is, uh, 40% the whiskey, uh, 30% the people you're with and, and 30%, uh, if someone else is paying for it. <laughs> That's some good percentages there. <laughs> yeah. I, I really did enjoy the McAllen number two, but unfortunately the McAllen number one predated the shop. So I've never been able to, to try it before. So if anyone out there has a little, little sample they'd like to send, uh, Todd at destinationsellers.com.au. Um, we can get you uh, we do a little tradesies. What was it like, mate, the McCallum number one? Uh, well, that's a, it's, a, it's a tough question to ask because it has been a while since I tasted it. It was, uh, wasn't my own bottle that uh, we'd open up. It was for a, a vertical tasting of the one through to the four. and uh, They're all very different whiskeys and... and they're all amazing whiskies just by themselves, but some just don't stack up next to the others. Uh, a good example of that is, you know, if we were to taste, um, one is a great whiskey, and uh, honestly, it's it's, uh, it's my. I'm just gonna put me on the spot now. Uh, probably my third favourite of the editions. Um, it might upset a few people that have, have got some bottles at home that are um, going up in value as we speak, um, or some people that are looking to buy it, but. Um, my order, I'd say, would probably be um, two, four, one, three, five. And I really haven't drunk a lot of the edition five just because they're selling so quickly. So it's nice to be able to come back and revisit the, it right now. But um, again, it's probably the closest to a traditional Macallan style that, that what we've done. Um, just because obviously Bob wouldn't want to steer too far away from it. And as I said, it's only very limited release just to see if it will work. And um, I think the, the results have shown that it's really gone gangbusters. Um, but, you know, if I'm sitting down, I just want something that's you know, amazing. You know, the edition number three is, is is definitely up there as well. But sitting between the two and the four, the two is probably the, the boldest of them. Um, the edition three just doesn't kind of sit up next to it. So whenever we're doing vertical tastings, it's always quite hard to, to work out what order we're going to do them in, whether... Uh, it's the edition five, which is the new one, and that's got to be the hero. Or if we're tasting the edition number one, and that's got to be the hero with the tasting as well. Well, with that note, let's try the number five, shall we? Fantastic. Let's go on. We're going to drink purple. <laughs> now, I do just need to add after my little uh, my little tour of the Macallan, and uh, if anyone is going over there, you do have to be very careful these days because. Uh, drink driving laws in Scotland have really tightened up and it's 0.02 over there. So if you do go and do a tour, they ask if, if anyone's driving and they'll put in the little uh, vial for you to take away and drink when you get home. And um, I, uh, I, I did actually say that I wasn't driving. I did actually drive and um, I was really lucky to get this um, really nice BMW as my hire car when I was there. Uh, I'm really lucky for the fact that I, I drove back and, you know, I was driving along on, on the dual carriageway, um, which is uh, uh, 70 miles an hour, I think it is. Um, so it's like driving, you know, um, Melbourne to Ballarat, we got that little bit of extra speed. And I was making good time and I was going to get to the airport with a couple of hours to spare to put the fuel the car up and, uh, and, and return it and then go and check in and, and have a couple of whiskeys while waiting for my flight. And um, there was a, a pretty big crash uh, about halfway back and uh, Google Maps, uh, in all their glory, put me off onto a little side road, um, onto a single lane road with cars going in both directions, backed up and managed to get back onto the dual carriageway with the police to stop me. And um, 
I'd explained that I was on the way to the airport and looking for my way to get um, back through there, still using Google Maps, of course. Um, and he said, all right, so you just need to go down uh, a couple of miles, turn right, um, and then go to this town, this town, this town, this town. He just gave me four town names. And if anyone's been to Scotland, uh, they're not always the easiest ones to pronounce, let alone read. Um, but it was made worse for the fact that I recognised one town name, and that was Perth. So obviously, you know, Perth in Australia. Uh, I recognised one name and I was like, yep, got it, no worries. And, and I, off I drove. And Google Maps took me in a big lap all the way back around to the, to the carriageway again. And by that time, I was stuck in a queue of about um, uh, 200 cars in front of me waiting for them to, uh, to clear off the accident. Um, and all this time, I'm looking at the estimated time of arrival. It was just ticking up and up and up. And uh, I got to the stage where I actually um, called my, my girlfriend and I said, uh, I'm probably not going to get home tomorrow. Um, because I'm, I'm stuck here and uh, then eventually it did clear um, and obviously with a lot of impatient drivers and it being dual carriageway I managed to sit in the right hand lane in between all these cars which are almost bumper to bumper still doing um, about 100 miles an hour um, so I thought well I'm in the it's not just me doing it by myself speeding um, by that time that the alcohol had, had worn off so I was, I was quite sober um, but I was sitting on this dual carriageway doing about 100 miles an hour in the right-hand lane and, and managed to, to get to my flight and check into it with about half an hour to spare. So I was, I was quite lucky with that one. Um, but I'm definitely not uh, suggesting anyone should drink drive or speed at all. So let's move on to the edition number five now. So this one was uh, made by Sarah Burgess, uh, who was our master whiskey maker, or was our master whiskey maker, interim uh, master whiskey maker. Um, so she's produced this one to coincide with the fifth pillar of the Macallan, which is the natural colour. Uh, it's something that we really pride ourselves on is not adding any of that artificial uh, caramel colouring, still as caramel or more affectionately referred to as E150A. Um, all this colour comes naturally from a cast. So we released this one to, in, uh, to uh, show off this, this natural colour that we have. So I'm just going to quickly run you through the, uh, the six pillars of the Macallan and it's what we uh, hold true when we're making a whiskey. So uh, the first pillar is Easter Rocky's house. Uh, Easter Rocky's house was built in 1700 and it lies right in the middle of Macallan Estate. Uh, Macallan Estate is in Speyside. We've got about five miles of uh, the River Spey, which flows through some of the best uh, salmon fishing in Scotland. Uh, if you're into that kind of thing, you could, uh, you know, tell your partner you're off to do a fishing trip in Scotland and, and spend a couple of days at Macallan. Um, so Easter Rocky's House actually features a few times on all of our bottles there. We've got it on the cap as well, uh, on the closure. Um, it was, as I said, built in 1700 and it's a very traditional uh, manor style house. In fact, it's uh, said to be one of the most haunted houses in the region of Scotland. And uh, funny story that if you do ever get the chance to stay there, uh, they've got a lot of really heavy metal fire doors that tend to close automatically at about 11 o'clock at night. And it's not too long after they've just closed the bar downstairs and you've had dinner and you go up and you know, you, you've been told it's a little bit of a haunted house. So uh, you do sleep with your clothes on on top of the bed with your suitcase right next to you in case uh, you see a ghost and you need to make a quick exit. But um, they've got all these heavy metal fire doors that close automatically at night and uh, it does echo right around the place and there's about three or four of them that, that, that close and uh, it is quite unnerving. So I'll just uh, let you in on that secret just in case. Uh, the second pillar of the Macallan is our curiously small short stills. Uh, the shortest in space, so they produce a, a heavy, heavier style of spirit, which is perfect for what we're using to, to mature in, especially uh, majority of ex-sherry casks, uh, European oak as well. The third pillar is our finest cut. Uh, some distilleries will keep up to 20% of that final distillation that comes off, um, obviously discarding the heads and the tails. Uh, we'll keep it as, as little as 14% to ensure that we, we capture those heavier molecules of alcohol that come down, which will allow us for a, a better maturation. Uh, the fourth pillar of the Macallan is our uh, exceptional oak casks. As I said, we spend more on oak than any other malt distillery in Scotland. Uh, and uh, if we didn't, then Stuart would probably be out of a job and wouldn't have those amazing business cards with Master of Wood on them. <laughs> Number, of, <laughs> number five is, uh, is a, the uh, natural colour and then number six being um, the peel of spirit. Uh, so this one was, was done in conjunction with the Pantone Institute uh, and we, we wanted to, to create a, a colour which we'll call the Macallan colour. So this one's is Macallan purple. So 
If anyone ever wants to paint their house this colour, you can actually go in and request Macallan Purple. Um, you can paint your car this colour if you want. Um, but it's, it's a colour that is actually registered with the Pantone Institute uh, under Macallan. So uh, when we talked to them about it, they originally wanted to look at uh, the colour of whiskey and, and do a, a colour according to that. So I'm not sure anyone would ever want to, you know, paint their house that colour. Uh, uh, and that's the way they were looking at it. But when they went into Macallan to, to have a look at the whiskey that we got maturing there, we've, we've got a, a power wall in the distillery as well with over 400 bottles from a lot of different releases. There is a, uh, um, one of those 1926 releases, I think it's the 26, um, that recently sold for one and a half million pounds at auction uh, sitting there as well. So you can go in there and, and have your photo taken near it. Um, it they didn't realize the, the amount of colors and also variations that come from maturing whiskey. So whether it's a, a really light straw color from uh, ex bourbon cast or whether it's like a really deep, uh, rich uh, brown hue from, uh, from European oak. So also going through and tasting the Macallan, being known as being such a rich, bold whiskey, they wanted to choose a color that uh, was very bold. So they've chosen the two boldest ones, which is green and red and combine them to, to create this beautiful uh, purple colour, uh, which does actually grow on you quite a bit. Um, I was a bit shocked when I first saw it, but I absolutely love it now. And, and sitting amongst the, the rest of the edition range, it, it's, it's quite a beautiful colour. So um, to run you through the numbers again, if anyone's interested, um, five different styles of cask, 525 uh, casks have gone into the vatting. The tint of it is 20. Uh, we've got first fill bourbon barrels. Uh, and for each one of these, we've actually gone through and put the Pantone code of what the, the colour of the whiskey is when, when we pulled it out. Uh, so I won't go into that because that's getting a little bit too nerdy. Uh, we've got refill hogsheads and butts, which are American oak. Uh, first fill hogsheads and butts, American oak. First fill uh, butts, American oak, which come from Vassima. Um, first fill Hadosa, hogsheads and butts as well with that one. So. Um, Sarah's worked uh, quite extensively with Laurie Pressman, who was the vice president of the Pantone Institute, for uh, for coming up with this colour, which is um, absolutely absolutely amazing. So, uh, please, if someone does want to paint their, their house the uh, the Macallan colour, I will happily send you a, a bottle of Macallan whiskey if you want to do that. So, I do need to see proof first, though. I dare say, then you have proof of life as to <laughs> mm. <laughs> if you get away with it. That's it. Now, mate, this one was only released a, a few months ago. Is that right? Or was this later last year? Uh, yeah, so it was released in November last year. Uh, and as close to worldwide release as we can. Uh, unfortunately, Australia is quite a long way from Scotland as the, as the boat travels. Uh, it does have a few stops on the way, uh, coming through Asia and, and things like that. And it's really hard to control a, a worldwide release. Uh, we didn't get the edition one into Australia. The edition two came quite late because Spirits Platform has had uh, the Macallan brand for probably coming up to three years now before that uh, was under Coca-Cola. Uh, they didn't really do a, a great deal with the brand. They're, you know, 99% of their um, revenue comes from family brands like soft drinks and waters and, and energy drinks and things like that. Um, so uh, Macallan didn't give Coke a lot of the age statements and limited releases and, and interesting things. Uh, they had the uh, the Ruby, the Amber and Sienna, which were non-age statements. So Spirits Platform, our, uh, our sole business is with Spirits as, a, as the name would suggest. So uh, we've proven that we are, uh, are going to work really well with the brand. So we've started to get more of the age statements. As I said, we had the 72 year old, um, we're getting 25s and 30s and 40s. Uh, and then also a lot of the, uh, the editions now as well. So the edition two was very, very late coming into the market in Australia. We had it after the rest of the world had sold out of it. Uh, so by the time we were selling it here, it was already selling for twice as much over in America. Uh, the edition, and then, and then ever since then, we've, we've tried to be catch up to try and get in line with the, uh, with the worldwide releases. So hopefully with the edition six, fingers crossed, we'll, uh, we'll be able to sell it, um, when the rest of the world has it. Excellent. Now, mate, we've got a few few people tapping away at the moment. The most famous Macallan in the movies. Now, I, I'm a bit of a Bond fan. Who isn't? I mean, come on. 
I think he was at a 50 year old that was in Skyfall. Uh, yes, I believe it was a 50 year old in Skyfall. So uh, really, really great question that one. And it, it's, uh, it's quite a good story that um, obviously Bond uh, being Bond, uh, he has a, a penchant for some of the, the nicer things in life. And uh, McAllen has always been written into the, uh, the Bond stories, even in the books, as being Bond's favourite whiskey to drink or, or the only whiskey that he'll, he'll drink. Um, a lot of cock uh, cocktail uh, drinkers were probably a bit upset that Bond wanted his martini shaken. Um, uh, so they might think that like, he doesn't have a good taste for, for alcohol and things like that, but obviously uh, has a great taste for the Macallan. So if you're making a movie or a TV show and uh, you want your protagonist to be drinking a, a nice whiskey, you'll put a tender out to all the whiskey distilleries and say, how much would you pay to have your whiskey featured to be drunk by the, the hero, the hero character? Uh, with, with Bond, they approached us and just said, um, he'll be drinking whiskey in this one. Uh, would you like to give us something? So we gave them a 50-year-old for them, uh, for Bond to drink in Skyfall. Uh, there's a, a little TV show which is also famous for uh, their main character drinking Macallan, and that's Suits. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone's uh, seen it before, but their uh, their their lead Harvey Specter uh, is a big, high-flying, big-shot uh, lawyer. Uh, whenever he wins a big case, he'll always drink a Macallan, and I think it's a 30-year-old that he drinks in that, or a 25. It's uh, it's been a while since I watched it. Uh, the the gentleman that plays Harvey Specter, I, I can't remember his name. It's not really that important to the story. Um, it's his favourite whiskey. He's a Macallan, and he said that if he's going to be seen drinking whiskey on on camera he, he wants it to be mccallan so they put a tender out to us and said look um you're the only whiskey brand we want to feature in this tv show um uh how much will you pay to have the brand featured and obviously you know mccallan uh the peel of spirit uh we delightfully declined their offer uh for us to pay to have a whiskey featured in the show um we didn't even send them a, a bottle or anything obviously being a new TV show, uh, we'd never heard of it. Um, also, you know, probably never heard of the actor as well. So um, we, um, uh, they end up actually buying the whiskey themselves to, to feature in the show. Sorry, mate. So uh, in most of the other uh, famous movies too, the, the McCallum has never had to pay for any of the advertising. The, the producers or the actors or the script has also included it as part of the script. So you've never had to pay a cent for it. Exactly. Yep. As, as far as I know, we, we've never paid to have it feature in our, um, in any TV shows or movies. And, uh, you know, we, we do have a, a, a bit of a, an advertising budget that we use and, um, you know, it's featured quite regularly in, in magazines and uh, uh, quite recently more sort of, online advertising and things like that but that's more about telling a story about the brand than uh you know selling one of the the skews that we have brilliant 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 so what did everybody think of those drams should we uh should we launch a bit of a poll i think we should it'd be interesting to see what everyone thinks about them all right i'd be well, very interested if anyone preferred the naked grouse yeah, we'll get Jace to launch a poll there, everyone. So give it a crack. Please uh, please vote. Oh, we've had one vote for, uh, oh, for the Naked Grouse. So, Andy, I haven't voted for the uh, Naked Grouse, but um, the oldest bottle that I've owned is in the longest that I've owned a whiskey is a bottle of Famous Grouse from my 21st birthday unopened. Oh, fantastic. It's a good season age statement as well. You don't really see many of those at all. They tend to be the non-age statements these days. It's a 12-year-old. Still in the cylinder. Now, I do need to ask you, you're not drinking it because you don't enjoy it or is it more of a sentimental reason? Uh, purely sentimental. Okay, fantastic.
Well, the edition five, Andy. Did you did you see that there, Andrew, mate? Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Like, it's it's one of those things that you normally split a room and, and it shows that it really has um, through that with, you know, 21%, 32, 42, and then, you know, someone pranking the uh, the naked grouse bottle there. But um, it's, uh, it's, it's an absolutely fantastic whiskey. Um, as I said, they all do you know, all by themselves are, are amazing, amazing whiskies. Um, but uh, it's the, the thing that really interests me, especially about the edition number five, is um, it's all American oak that goes into it as well. Like there's no European oak with the edition five. So that's also going to um, probably aid in more of a, a softer profile with that one as well, with the flavour profile. Uh, but the edition five does surprise me a little bit. Um, as I said, I haven't drunk as much of that as what I have all the other editions. Um, but yeah, it's fantastic. Okay, yeah, Magician 5, Edition 5 uh, from Edition 3 and Edition 4. So a really nice little curve there amongst the, the attendees. But gee, you wouldn't turn any of them down, would you? They're all pretty bloody good. Yes, that's right. Now, um, for everyone out there that's that's wondering, we did manage to get a few bottles of the edition three, four. Um, don't ask me how or where or even why. I'm not going to ask at all. <laughs> <laughs> we've got them for you tonight. So, um, and of course, we've got some some cracker lacking specials on the naked grouse for everybody too. So, Jay, can you um, can you re tell everybody how many we've got and and what the prices are, please, mate? I reckon I can, if I can find them here. Now, um, we have, yeah, probably more naked grass than we'll need, and that's 45 bucks a bottle tonight. Tonight only, because that's an absolute giveaway. Uh, then we've got six McAllen Edition 3s at 275 a bottle. Uh, we have six Edition 4s at 275 a bottle, and we have no Edition 5s at no price. What a bargain that is. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, for, for whatever reason, the edition five, uh, it, it just didn't stay around this time. And, and with all the editions, they've, they've gone um, very, very quickly. Uh, but beautiful whiskey, it's really beautiful. Now, before we sign off with, with Andy there, um, just to let you know that um, our, our next event is on the 10th of June. So we'll have a week off and hopefully, hopefully Australia Post will uh, clear everything up for us and we'll get onto that. And that's with a beautiful Ben Rich distillery. Did I say that right, Craig? Ben Rich. Fantastic. Um, we've then followed up on the 17th of June. Uh, we go back to some Australian whiskies. Um, and this time we're going with Archie Rose and looking at their rye whiskies, which is, uh, yeah, we're really excited to, to try something a little bit different. And then on the 24th of June, we're looking to, um, to Melbourne's own Andy Starwood. We're, um, we're going to have a look at the, the local Victorian distillery that's been doing great, um, not only in Australia, but on, a, on an international scale. And um, we're hoping to, to show you some of their limited release stuff. Um, so really looking forward to that. Um, on another note, um, we would... Uh, our personal note, uh, just to to say to to everyone, um, for Dominic, mate, it's all on the on the website. So, um, Chase, if you can just do a link through to that for me. Um, if you jump onto the website and look up McAllen's, they'll be on there for you. Um, on a personal note, um, it is with great sadness, a very heavy heart, that we have to say goodbye to to Jason for his last last one tonight. Um, for the last three or so years, he's been my right-hand man in the shop. Um, he's been definitely our moral compass. Um, <laughs> most definitely a spiritual guide, not in the way you're thinking, but um, <laughs> definitely it comes across as like, oh, that's a cracking dram. You have to get that. Oh. Um, he, is, uh, he is Tony to my Richie. Everything's really groovy. And uh, we just want to thank him very much for the last few years. He's, he's back off to Ireland for his family. So thank you for everything you've done, mate. We'll miss you greatly. It's been an absolute pleasure. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Now, for the rest of you guys, if you've got anything you would like to say to Andy, he's just going to be a very polite person and hang around and have a bit of a chat. Um, I can see that we've got... Um, if we were to go for an after hours bit of a drink, I reckon Wayne's place is looking pretty damn tasty there. Look at that. <laughs> oh, bloody hell. And Glenn's not doing too bad either. Um, we thank you very much as always for joining us. Um, we, we're still uh, navigating our way through through these uh, isolation times, um, but on a, on a definitely in Tassie, it's a very crisp evening. So it is nice to be at home and and having a having a dram. Um, Andy, thank you so much for your time, mate. Um, always a pleasure. We hope to host you back in Hobart again soon. Um, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm very much looking forward to getting back down to Tasmania uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. And for all of you, as I said, if you, if you do want to, to book in for our upcoming events, please jump online. For those you want to grab a bottle, there's only a few left, but um, they're over to you now. We've held them back for you. Um, we hope that you've had a had a great evening. I'm certainly very impressed with these dreams, and uh, have yourself a really good evening. Thank you, and good night.